And I just want to now hand over to the Lancaster Health Festival team, not Han Lancaster Health Festival team, no, <laughs> the Health Innovation Campus team at Lancaster University. So we have Sam Winder and Glyn Jones here today to take us on a virtual tour around the HIP. So I'll hand over to you two. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about um, the Health Innovation Campus. We're actually sat here together, Sam and myself, in the, in the building we're about to show you, uh, take you on a tour of. Um, so I'll kick off by introducing myself. I'm Glyn Jones, the Commercial Partnerships Manager for the, uh, the Health Innovation Campus. My role is mainly to look at bringing commercial companies in to work in collaboration with the academics, uh, with our students, with the healthcare professionals that we work with across Lancashire and, and beyond from the NHS, from social care, from care homes, or any, any health professional. But also what we want to do, uh, which is why it's great to be able to talk to you about the, the campus, is to involve citizens, if you like, that the, the population of Lancaster and Morecambe, uh, but also Lancashire, to bring those uh, guys in. And I'll talk more about that as we go through the presentation. And I'm Sam Winder, and again, thank you for taking the time to come and see us give you a tour around the building. Um, as I said, we are in the building, which is quite exciting. Um, obviously, socially distanced, we're still figuring out how the practicalities of that, but um, it's quite exciting to actually be in it now. Um, I am the ERDF, which is a European Fund um, Programme Manager. So I oversee the delivery of a £2 million project which is working with SMEs based in Lancashire. So SMEs covers obviously your traditional limited trading companies, but it also covers social enterprises, charities. Um, it's got quite a broad spectrum of organizations that we can work with, companies that are working in health currently or interested about working in health. And I'm gonna tell you more about that after Glenn's given you a tour of the building. Thanks. So, um, some of you may have driven past uh, the building site that was um, the Health Innovation Campus for a long time. Uh, but now the first building, Health Innovation One, is, is finished. We moved in uh, about a few weeks ago in dribs and drabs. Um, the building is now open for teaching. Uh, it hosts the medical school, which I'll come back to. And those medics, we work hard anyway, but they're in. Those of them who couldn't finish last year, their last academic year because of COVID, they're now back in catching up. So we're lucky to be able to come here. We're not here all the time, but we use it as much as we can. It's, it's a lovely space. Hopefully you'll get an idea of what it's like. So the, the, the project so far has cost um, 41 million uh, to get to this point. There will be, if plans, and we all know what happens to our plans, but uh, if plans go to, to fruition, there may be two other phases of further building. But for the moment, Health Innovation One is in 1.8 acres of, of green parkland. Uh, with some some trees around it, uh, it's it's the home to, as I've mentioned, the Faculty of Health and Medicine, or, or two two parts, two aspects of the faculty. Uh, we host here the medical school and also the Division of Health Research. The third aspect of the faculty, which is biological life sciences, uh, are the laboratories that we use. Those laboratories are still on the main campus uh, and will stay there until phase two, where we can build. Uh, some additional space for them. But eventually the Health Innovation Campus will be the home to the Faculty of Health and Medicine. This is the Health, health Innovation One is the health hub, if you, is the innovation hub. So the, the aim is to create a collaborative space, uh, one that allows different groups of stakeholders to come together. We use the phrase casual collisions a lot, or possibly creative anarchy, but we, we fully understand that the best way for new ideas to be formed and existing ideas to be pursued is by giving people opportunities to talk. We've all done meetings, uh, especially over the last six months, which have, have a purpose, but we're much more about creating collaborative spaces. Where we're coming to, to you from uh, live is the Innovation Lab, which is a space designed to create collaborative conversations. Um, the whole point with the campus is to look at tackling those larger population health challenges that we have the wider determinants of health, our, our diet, our exercising, our mental health, all of which have a, a long-term um, influence on our physical health. But if we can tackle those earlier and earlier, we will grow older and healthier at the same time and not grow older with long-term conditions, but actually stay healthier for longer. So we, we hope that 
Innovation Campus will bring together health system leaders, patients and citizens, students, academics, businesses, in whatever form we need to, to tackle those long-term challenges that we have. Thank you. So before Glyn takes you on a tour of the building today, I just wanted to give you an idea of the thinking behind the HIC and actually how it's come to fruition. So the project started about six years ago um, and basically it was the academics at the university and some of the leaders in the local health system and the councils all recognizing the need to do things differently in healthcare and to look at a place and a space where we can actually come up with innovative solutions around healthcare. So the common challenges that were identified, which I'm sure you'll all be aware of, number one, the NHS being in crisis. So even before COVID hit us, the NHS was struggling to manage the demand it was facing and the lack of resources it had to meet that demand, that spend was outstripping funding. And I think the crisis has just made it even more apparent that we need to look at actually how we can keep people out of traditional healthcare systems and actually stop get people getting sick in the first place. Um, also, people, citizens are getting chronic conditions earlier in life and they're living longer with those chronic conditions and also the conditions they're living in are not suitable to help them manage the healthcare as well. Um, as quite a staggering fact is that 64% of Lancashire adults are obese and also we have three air quality management areas within the region, which is very high as a region. So we've got Goldgate, Lancaster and Carnforth. And Goldgate actually has one of the worst levels of pollution in the country as well. And then one of the big things that we're hoping to address with the HIC is health inequalities. So where you're born can affect how you live by 10 years. So actually some of the most deprived areas within Lancashire and also this is reflected across the country have staggeringly lower death rates than the countries that actually have different socioeconomic de demographics as well. So the ambition of the HIC is to create a healthier future. So it's a space where we want to bring people together from different healthcare services, community groups, citizens, everybody that is impacted by a healthcare system, which is each and every one of us, to work together to look at how we can design and create better transport links, better green spaces, encourage people with healthier eating, health and social care deserve services, how we design them for the future and how we develop more interactive communities and ways of educating those citizens and communities to take better care of their health. So the way that we're looking at addressing these healthcare challenges is going right back to said how we keep people out of traditional healthcare settings such as the NHS. So it's all for us, it's all about looking at the wider determinants of health. So 80% of factors that actually determine health are non-medical. So it's all about looking actually how we interact as society's communities, how we eat, how we exercise, how we move. And I think, again, these factors, people have become so much more aware of the impact of these since COVID as well. So they're really coming to the forefront, not only of the healthcare providers' minds, but of people's and citizens and community minds. So what we actually want to do is look at the wider determinants of health, identifying the ones where we have the academic expertise and the community expertise across the region to look at how we can introduce new systems, products, places, services, and how we can look at long-term education to make change that has impact. So then, space. Thank you. Glenn's going to tell you how the space has been designed to enable this now. So I think it's, as Sam mentioned, at the the campus has been years in, in its conception, um, but we're, we're pleased to be finally in the first building. The vision has always been that collaborative space to bring those five main stakeholder groups together. As I mentioned, the academics and businesses, healthcare staff in the broader sense, patients, citizens, if you're not ill already, uh, and students. We already bring academics together to work with students, obviously, because that's what we are really, we're a teaching establishment. We bring academics together with clinicians to do research. We do a lot of business work with academics because we do a lot of business support. But I want to try and create a, uh, this, use this space to create meetings between all five of those groups at the same time, if we can. So it's that collaborative space that will lead to long-term health impact. As Sam was saying, that 80% you know, of uh, 
reasoning, if you like, for being unwell are, are really in our hands. And COVID's a good example of that. The stuff we can do around social distancing, washing our hands, uh, washing, uh, wearing face masks, all that's in our control. If, if that doesn't work for whatever reason, then the NHS is there to step in, but we shouldn't put all the onus on the NHS. Uh, so it's about also educating in the, in the nicest possible way, uh, the, the population as well about exercise, diet, and all those other uh, determinants of health. It's special to us because the university is a great place uh, as, an, as, as a place to work and as a place to, to study. We're a top 10 university, we're International University of the Year this year. Uh, maybe an interesting question about whether that's a great time to be International University of the Year or not, but we are. It, it's, a, it, it's also sat in the Northwest. Now, I've, I've, I was brought up in North Wales and I've always worked in the Northwest and I think it's a lot of benefits to doing so. As a region, we've got lots to offer. We've got a whole range of um, landscapes from Granny to Wharton in the Lake District down to urban conurbations in Preston and down south towards Manchester. So lots of different uh, places to study and do research. As a university, we've got some great links already. And if you add into that the health system that is well linked up, we can work quite agilely, we hope, with, uh, with our partners. And it may not be known to, to those outside the business community, but the university is uh, very good at business support. It's not what you think of a university it is, but we have a very good track record in running a range of funded programmes to support businesses in Lancashire and Cumbria and beyond Cheshire and Warrington and Manchester as well. We've touched on the ambition already. It's about improving population health uh, in the, and the outputs, not just short term, but long term. To us, um, impact doesn't happen until at least a couple of years after you've tried uh, to change things. So we're here for the long term to look at that long term impact. There isn't a story as yet other than what we're going to tell you, um, but we want to invite you and those stakeholder groups we mentioned to become part of that story. For example, we're offering the space to local patient groups to come and run their events. We're not charging for that. It's a, it's a public space. We want you to get in here run uh, so for example the Man Man the Morecambe and Lancaster fibromyalgia group are going to be hosting their their user sessions here and we want to offer that to charities or whoever else wants to use the space because that way we bring people citizens into the to the space as well what I'll do now is just show you uh, some floor plans and it's not to show you the detail because I know you can't read that but it's to show you the way we've designed the space to to promote collaboration and interaction the key thing to note with this is the colours. So the pink areas are academic spaces. The yellow spaces are the collaboration spaces. Green is the shared things like corridors and the, the canteen and stuff, which I'll come on to. So this is the ground floor. You would come in here if you park up in the car park and come in, you'll come onto this floor. And as you can see, majority of it is actually dedicated to collaborative spaces. We've got a big lobby into which we'll hopefully start using it for art and exhibitions of whatever we can show people. COVID signing is actually something we're looking to do an exhibition on. Uh, there is also a large lecture theatre, uh, top right, which could host 125 students, but with social distancing, that's much less. Different academic offices. The HIC team that Sam and myself work within is situated in the middle of this floor in the big open plan office in the middle. We've got some hot desking when we're allowed to hot desk again for businesses and some small business offices. So this floor alone is, is full of mixed uh, mixed mode. If you like we've got some sports and exercise science academics. We've got some senior, the dean and some associate deans are located on this floor, as well as four businesses plus the, the engagement team. The innovation lab, which we're sat in now, we'll show you some pictures of those are on this floor as well. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the opportunities to collaborate. This is uh, a picture of the lobby. The innovation lab is on the right, and that's where we're sat at that tall table. A typical meeting room, yeah, uh, we will have meetings, no doubt, but lots of lights. Uh, that's one of the great things with the building is the way they've designed it. Uh, there's a three floor atrium uh, in, as of the lobby, and that brings in so much light. It's, it makes it feel a healthier space and a safe space as well in terms of biosecurity. That large lecture theatre I mentioned, this is it. Normally we could jam 125 students in there. At the moment, uh, it's 20 people getting in there at any one time. 
Floor B is arguably even more important because this is where the, can't, the Hive Cafe is, uh, the coffee shop. The heart of it. But, yeah, they, mm -hmm. definitely where we hope a lot of those conversations and uh, initial kicking off ideas will happen. So again, a floor with mixed accommodation, uh, some more teaching spaces this time uh, in terms of uh, lecture theatres, uh, so sort of teaching rooms, large business offices, the canteen, which is the big green space in the middle there, plus a business lounge, which is there for our resident businesses, plus any visiting businesses. So if you're a business and you want to book a meeting room, that's fine. We can, uh, there's a range of, of meet, I think of 12 different meeting rooms available, plus the business lounge to sit in. Uh, to take calls or whatever and this is a, again it, one, yeah, it gives you an idea of the views we've got out the the, can, the cafe window and this is the business lounge which is glass to three sides which looks out over Bailrick House and the rugby pitch if you know the campus you can see in the background out of the back window actually the cycle path so this is the cycle path that comes out of town onto the health innovation campus then onwards past the sports center onto the main campus so very much in terms of its design we recognize you know we can't tell people what to do we need to live the the message as well so exercising and space there's some great showers here for example um, there's a couple of bike lockers so we're about showing what can be done as well floor c uh, it's a four floor building so uh, we're on the third floor effectively here Again, more academic space because um, this is where the medical school sits. So the medical school, the, the right-hand side, the purple areas, the, um, we have an eight-bed ward there, is, which is there for obviously for teaching clinical skills, bedside manner, stuff like that, uh, plus a clinical anatomy learning centre, which is full of those uh, skeletons. Obviously, I think there are six skeletons in there, which aren't real, I've, I've been told, they're plastic skeletons. Uh, plus plastic models of ears and livers and knees and whatever else our medical students need to uh, need to use to to learn about anatomy and physiology plus some other business meeting rooms and business space and the the fourth floor oh sorry this this is a large business office um so we can accommodate four people at, at desks and a couple so these are uh, there are four of those we've had so much demand even before when this was a building site uh, back over the last year, we, we took people around and that's created a lot of demand for space. And I think COVID has also re resulted in offices or businesses looking at using their spaces differently. We've proven beyond doubt that we can work remotely uh, and we can achieve and uh, complete jobs, achieve targets. So our companies are looking to work differently. So somewhere like the HIC can be part of a mixed way of working. You work from home if you need to be at your desk, come into the HIC if you want to collaborate. The top floor is the division of health research. So uh, no uh, commercial or engagement space there at all. It's all where the, um, the clever people sit and, and think. That includes things like the Center for Aging Research, uh, the International Observatory we have on end of life care. They're all based there. This is a video, there's no sound. Um, so I'm gonna talk over those bits that I feel might need to be highlighted. Um, so I'll just run that. It's I think about a minute uh, and a half long, and it's uh, we we commissioned a drone fly through uh, of the campus. We didn't break any windows, so we, we were pleased about that. So the the old oak tree that we fly over there was protected with a tree protection order. You can see it again there. It's the cafe. Okay, yeah. And the Spanish steps, which are a great asset if you want to do some uh, events. This is where we're sat at that table. And this is our view from that tip, other the large lecture theatre, as we said, not maybe as large as it was in terms of occupation. This is one of the business co uh, hot desking spaces, which when we can, we will reopen that that meeting room we showed you. Each floor has a, a, a full length corridor called a street that is brings that light in. This is a small business space. This is the. Uh, director's office there's another view of the business lounge actually looking out over the rugby pitch to Bailrick house that three floor three floors of light wells these are breakout spaces the business lounge a large office you can if you notice the windows are all screened so we open the windows and you straight into fresh air so that brings a lot of uh, air into the building this is the ward um, without the beds in it when we took it 
a lockable bike shed, elect obviously electric uh, charging points for the vehicles, and the, um, the receding view of the campus. So hopefully that's giving you an idea of the space. Um, the best way to experience it is obviously to visit. Uh, and we, we would be happy to host tours for businesses or, as I mentioned, patient groups. We've done that already. Um, just get in contact. Uh, the contact details will be at the end anyway. Um, well, we've, we've agreed that we'll, we'll have a Q&A at the end as well if, if you happen to stay on and do so. So, um, the... I've mentioned collaboration, I suppose. So the whole point of the the, the HIC, the Health Innovation One building is to, is to create this community. It'll have different aspects, it'll have different focuses, it'll have different membership, but the whole, the whole idea is by creating communities and comfort and trust, uh, we can have conversations that may have been difficult to, to have before because people have been in different places. Uh, it's about appreciating as well the good stuff that we've done. We're not here to lecture and just point out faults and talk about deficits the NHS has. We can also celebrate the very good stuff that's been happening definitely in the last six months, but also over the, over the last few years. Before I came here, I, was, uh, I worked at Lancashire Care. I was the Innovation Programme Manager there. Uh, and in the four years I was there, there was so much good stuff that, that Lancashire Care did in terms of mental and community health that we need to also celebrate that. So this isn't just, I think, about looking at where the problems are, it's looking at where there are already solutions and bringing those to bear. Things will have to be adapted to suit Lancaster, Morecambe, Lancashire, but I think we can bring in and adopt some ideas from, from further afield. Okay. So, yeah, picking up on what Glyn said, that obviously this is a very ambitious project for the university, but it will, it will not work unless we give the space and the community what it needs to grow so it's just as important that people from the region and nationally as well come and take part in this and they develop this community and they make it their own and they drive it so it, it's very ambitious we have big plans for it but we need we need people to come and buy into it and be part of it because they're actually going to be the gold dust of the building and where the magic really happens mm -hmm. So one of the ways that we're looking to do that is looking to work with SMEs, particularly at the moment, who are obviously looking to find SMEs that are innovative and flexible and agile and that are looking to actually understand the opportunities in healthcare right now and, and build on those and adapt their business to respond to them. So as a university, we have a really strong track record of working with SMEs. I think it's over 20 years now since we delivered our first SME support project. We've currently got 13 ERDF, so that's the European Regional Development Funded projects running to support SMEs. And they start right from companies that have an idea, so they're not even a startup yet, to more established companies that are looking to double the turnover or get market access with a new idea. And we're actually, as Glenn said earlier, we're home to 50 businesses as well. So we're really keen to look at bringing that expertise together. And for the last two years, we have been delivering the SME support project. So we've worked with 150 businesses to date across the Lancashire region. I guess when I say businesses, I do also mean social enterprises, charities, organisations. And um, some of those haven't been working in healthcare, but they've been interested in exploring the opportunities or the market and understanding it better. Some of uh, the business is completely unrelated to healthcare, but have been interested in diversifying into it and some already work in healthcare. The premise though is we're looking to support companies with different offerings to develop a product, process or service that meets current healthcare demands. So we do this um, for a number of ways. We do two-day workshops well we used to we've just put them on hold so they were face-to-face two-day workshops which were all about companies that were very early stage with an idea and just wanted to explore a theme in health where we'd give them an overview of the challenges the opportunities and then we'd use design thinking tools so the project was actually designed by a management school to help them work through that idea to also to give them the tools actually how we take an idea to an innovation. Um, so it's also about building capacity in the sector as well. 
We also run an innovation program, which is um, much more intense and um, lasts normally around six to 12 weeks. And we have, have just removed those online and we're running our second cohort next week. Um, so we tend to bring groups of 10 people together and we want them to have an idea that they're looking to develop and we work with them as a group and again also is designed by the management school to try and take that idea to the next stage and then we have a digital prototyping offering so within the school of computing and communications we have a team of developers and it's exactly the same premise so it's how we help a company take an idea to down the stages of technology readiness um, but it's looking at getting that actually to prototyping so we can do things from as simple as actually just giving them an analysis of the technologies that could help them get that idea or we can actually build a physical prototype so companies can test it and see it working so we tend to work with companies for around three to six months on that um, and for us that's you know we, we see a lot of things actually rapidly accelerate because we're helping them move forward more quickly um, and I suppose it's fair to say that the other offering is most businesses welcome talking to patients and to academics and that's what they get here isn't just the, uh, the, the brilliant support program but they get access to patient groups yeah. to students as well which makes a world of difference when they're designing new interventions yeah it's all about the follow-on as well so when companies have gone through the project or the program actually what happens next so we have the wider health innovation campus team who are there to connect people but also it's about us bringing them into the building so they can access the resources and we're looking at pushing definitely student projects as much as an option that people they do exist but I think a lot of companies aren't aware of actually the wide range of student projects that are available and funding opportunities and really building the academic community so we can take ideas where they can be tested and bounced around with academics and patients yeah. alike. Our academics are norm traditionally measured on research excellence or latterly on teaching excellence um, which we do well in both those categories, but we're now the universities in the UK are now measured on knowledge exchange. So how much how how much impact we can create in terms of jobs, new products, new services from the academic knowledge that's been generated at the university. So that again is a role for the HIC is to create the exchange conversations and create repositories, if you like, for that knowledge to be exchanged into, which is outside the university. The university is good at what it does. It needs partnerships with healthcare or business to achieve the impact we need long term through that knowledge exchange. And so we're two years into the project now. So like I said, we've worked with 150 companies and we've learned an incredible amount about the types of organisations that are looking for support. And we've done a lot of work with well-being, the well-being sector. Um, and much, I think the demand from social enterprises and charities has been so much higher than we were expecting. And it's been really rewarding to actually look at how we can embed support at an early stage to help them. So we basically help them fail early or fail fast or get their idea developed more quickly. Um, so that's been quite rewarding. But what we're hoping to do, we're hoping the project will roll out for another two years, is that actually activity will be themed more around clusters. So it will be much more thematic what we're doing. So we'll identify, based on our academic strengths and the feedback we've had to date, areas where we think we can actually push the activity. And ideally, then there'll be communities that create around that need. So. Um, there's lots of opportunity that we'd love and welcome feedback from you guys as a community where you'd like to see that go in as well. Yeah. Um, and then, I don't think we need the videos just of a, if you don't need no, to no, see no. Okay. Um, then just the story to bring it to life. So this is, um, so I wanted to highlight the story of Cam, who's the co-founder of eBusiness, because I think it highlights that actually some of the organisations we work with don't come through traditional routes. So Cam actually was already running a business. They um, ran a security camera company, but he in his personal life was having um, problems managing his father's healthcare, who was suffering quite chronically from dementia. And he was very frustrated with the technology that was being used and also the services, the support package that was being wrapped around it. And he wanted to look to see if there was a more innovative way to do this. So he came to us to talk about his idea. 
and we worked with him to develop a prototype that actually took the technology he already had in his business and embedded it into the home of a dementia um, sufferer and looked at actually how that technology could be used to not only manage the citizen's welfare but actually calm as a caregiver as a personal caregiver and then the actual professional caregivers as well and he's gone on now to develop this product which actually is a sort of security system technology that actually provides alert and interacts as well with the citizen uh, and for me that's is one of our smaller well that we work with lots of different sizes organizations but a small organization that had a huge success diversifying to healthcare and we were really proud to be able to work with him on the start of that journey and speed him up getting there great thank you so that that uh whiz through half an hour has been um a summary of what the health innovation campus is currently where it wants to go and how it intends to get there but as we've alluded throughout the presentation, it's not going to get anywhere without conversations with those larger uh, distinct stakeholder groups. So those that, of you that are listening, thank you very much. Tell your friends, I suppose, um, about the opportunities. Uh, the contact details are, are up there um, and we're happy to exchange emails and phone numbers or whatever if needs be to create those conversations and see what we can do. Um, we are happy to take some questions. We're just asking if you want to ask a question, just tell us who you are, what your interests are, uh, and then ask your question, obviously, so we can get an understanding of where you're coming from. Can I uh, stop your screen sharing? Are you finished with that now? Yeah, if, if you're happy. Oh, um, the, the next, uh, let me just put the next one up because it's got um, some some oh, of those yeah. contact details on there, but it'll be in the recording anyway, won't it? I suppose. And if anybody is interested. Yeah. So yeah, otherwise, yeah, Anna, feel free to take back control. Thank you. It just helps me to see everyone. Um, so, Claire Louise, you have a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and introduce yourself and ask a question? Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah Hi. Sorry, as we were talking. <laughs> Hi, Anna. Um, as we were talking, I just um, had a. A, a thought something occurred to me so I'm a social Im impact professional uh, which means that I work with commercial organizations to help them embed practices and cultures which support social need so it's a so social responses and environmental um, and it just occurred to me that um, there are some research gaps that would be particularly useful for me um, in terms of certainly around um, positive outcomes for people with long-term and chronic health conditions um, and around maintaining independence and possible employ possibly employment. Um, and so I'm just interested in whether um, it's feasible to kind of have a discussion about research projects or that kind of thing. Yeah, of, of course. Um... The, the role we have is, is partly that's our matchmaking as well, I suppose, is looking to see through the partnership managers in the, in the faculties who is available, who's, who has that interest that you, that you have that can share. Do, do you have some data you already collect? No, I have, I have basically some, I have some questions <laughs> <laughs> that it would be really good to see if A, there is existing data on, or B, whether some primary research with um, beneficiary groups could be. Uh, yeah. Sam mentioned um, wellbeing, there's an organisation, an embryonic uh, organisation called Wellbeing Lancashire, who focuses really on businesses and how they look after the staff in terms of mental health as, as well as physical health as well. Yeah, I think the mental health agenda is big. I think for me, it's more, um, I mean, the, yes, mental health is big, but it's more specifically around moving people who are long term out of work into employment by recognising the specific support needs that they may have because they are living and managing a long term health condition. The, the other, we have a part of the organisation, the Work Foundation as well, that we host, um, which is a national organisation, but we host them out of here. So, Basically, yeah, I think it'd be worth having a conversation with you, with the right people in the meeting. So um, if you're happy to do so, share some contact details somehow. Um, you, you I'll, put, I'll, put my, I'll put my email in the chat, yeah. shall I? It's fine. Like, yeah, okay. If you're happy to do that, then that, that's the quickest way. I'll, I'll, I'll reply so you have my contact details and then we'll see who we can make an introduction to. 
I, I, so just in case people don't know on zoom you can send um your contacts privately as well so then if you want to share them privately or if anyone else would like to share them privately you just literally click where in the chat where it says everyone you select the person that you want to send the message to okay um i see we have another question okay. from innovate oh wait. <laughs> Sorry, that's uh, that's me, Diane. Diane Lamb. Um, All right. uh, I, I got rather confused when I was uh, coming into it this morning. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I, I'm uh, in, interested in the whole work that you've been doing in terms of um, uh, working with with dementia. Um, uh, I worked for a time. Um, uh, uh, with, with one of the uh, organisations that supports dementia um, clients um, and I wondered what your link was with MAC, the clinical research of uh, Penny Fields and that, that yes. area um, and i obviously interested in the work that you've done, done with CAM regarding um, you know the security, the the, the development of um, uh, of of, uh, of of a technology that can actually help dementia. But I um I and I wondered sort of what's going on and what you view might the future what you view, view the future might be in that whole area because it's a massive area okay. of uh, of need and what you can contribute to it. Okay. As you well, as you mentioned, Penny Folds um, and the Defying Dementia Charity is something the university set up with, with Penny, who works for for Mark Research. So we know Penny well, and I've collaborated with her. Um, I mentioned I was at Lancashire Care before I came here, and then we had an innovation test bed, uh, which was part of an NHS England program, and we looked at dementia care there as one of four groups we were looking at with long term conditions. Uh, and in doing that, we work closely. This is how I got to know the university better. Actually. We work closely with that Centre for Ageing Research here, which is where the majority of the dementia work uh, happens. There's, I don't know if you know somebody called Gareth Chalfont, who works here. He looks specifically at, um, at dementia as well. So we do have some uh, academics looking at that space, but it's, it's, uh, there's also research, as you say, into you know, plaques and tangles and the physical attributes of dementia, but also more importantly, I think from our viewpoint, given what we've said this morning, it's about the, 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 the caring aspects, I suppose, how we can improve the quality of life, how we can sustain uh, a quality of life for longer, and also how we support the carer. That was always one of the quandaries with a testbed is you have the person with the diagnosis, but the impact is as uh, severe, if you can argue, as, uh, on the carer as well. So it's about supporting mm -hmm. both sides. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the, we first met Cam, so we had a dementia themed workshop. So we had Carol Holland, who's our lead mm -hmm. academic on working around dementia in the Centre for Aging Research. So she um, set out the challenges and her ambitions and the areas she thinks that we could be working as a, a community mm -hmm. to address and improve dementia. And then we set that we had 20 attendees um, to that one. We set them challenges to work together. So it was again about, bringing people from different backgrounds to try and address challenges um, and then then Cam came from that and then he went on to the digital support to develop that idea so, the, so what I was saying about us looking to really develop clusters and themes yeah. is to bring that actually bring that team together that first worked together but broaden it out so that people like yourself who are actually interested in seeing what's available and what's happening and then give them a space to try and drive things forward and bring the academics in as, and see what happens. Was it, yeah. so, was it Diane? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, Diane, that, what, I, I don't know if you, um, you're aware but we the Centre for Aging Research as Sam mentions uh, led by Carol Holland uh, is about to host uh, a town, what they call the town and gown events. I don't know if you've been. Yes, yeah. I've been to them in the past, but I don't yeah. didn't know. Yeah, they're, well, obviously they're going ahead, but uh, what do you know? They'll be online. Right. Uh, so there's an assumption of obviously technology there, but um, they're coming up soon, actually. So uh, if you haven't seen them, I'll, I'll dig out um, the details. I think there's a, con a full town and gown day event, and I think there's also a an hour lunchtime session as well. 
within the next couple of weeks. So I'll share that. Uh, if you're happy to provide us with some contact details, or I can share that maybe with Anna, she can pass it on to you if you're happy to have a contact. Hi Anna, you also aware the work that Age Concern have been doing as well. So they've got the dementia bus, um, which we're hoping to bring up actually, because so oh. it, it takes you into a virtual reality environment on the bus and you spend two hours experiencing the world from the perspective of somebody that has dementia. So we'd love to bring a group of people together and set them a challenge to see actually based on that, how could they bring their minds together? Yeah. And Age Concern is a good example in that, that um, they're an organisation we've supported, they've attended our workshops and we've talked about design thinking. Uh, their yeah. senior group came along and they've even had meetings after the workshops of their, of their own internal uh, purposes, if you like. So that's another example of, we don't just work with businesses in terms of, commercial entities even though most charities now have to be commercial because the money isn't there anymore for donation um, but we do work with the broader sense of got age uk as well the brand partners in lancashire and uh, west cumbria uh, so again yeah that, that's the, an example of the that workshop where we had age concern mixed in with more commercial businesses and with age uk and, and with age Direct uk yeah. gave, gave us uh, as Sam has mentioned, clusters, yeah, the, the groups of businesses and academics and stakeholders that can uh, sort of knock edges off each other and get, get to know, be a bit more comfortable solving problems. So, yeah. so that, that's where we are. Hopefully we can have an impact to answer your second question about what we're doing about things. If you like. Thank you. Great. And just to point out that Claire Louise has mentioned that Gareth is worthwhile talking to. I'll see um, Gareth's cell phones. Yeah and that there are great opportunities around use of green space um, by people living with dementia. Yes. Um, so I just want to highlight that. And then Nick, you've been waiting with your virtual hand up for a while, so <laughs> go ahead with your question. Hi, nice to meet everyone. Um, it was just a bit a different topic slightly. Um, I work for the Well Communities CIC um, and we operate a hub and sport model okay. um, for substance misuse recovery services that includes abstinence based housing and we work through the gate scheme with prisons we work in hospitals with the dual diagnosis team um, we run family support so we've got a genuine huge collaborative model um, you might say um, and we have had a little bit of research looked into by Professor David Guest looking at building social and recovery capital I'm a bit of a, a psychology nerd I did my degree <laughs> at Lancaster so oh, um, for me I'm looking at um, how we could utilize the more of the business aspects if you like of the innovation hub with the research into how this is looking at the long-term benefits of utilizing all these different spokes as part of of this type of service because i know there's lots of support type models about at the moment they seem to be uh for me it's about building bridges between the services rather than plugging gaps and i think that we do that well but i'm not sure how we could look at integrating that into sort of academic side and the research side if that makes any sense <laughs> yeah, and you, you mentioned businesses as well so there's the academic research question which is that we can come back to but in terms of you, you, what, what sort of links were you thinking about with businesses well for example um you've got the criminal justice system we've got statutory agencies like cgl local authority um it's things like we tend to employ a lot of people we're a lived experience based organization so we want to connect with businesses and to give people an opportunity i mean our director for example was a, a prolific offender himself and um he okay. didn't have the best track record but he's but he's he started this organization a long time ago and has been in recovery for 15 years but we do still struggle i, I think what I, now you mentioned that I'm sure my, we have a colleague called Steve Milan, Dr. Steve Milan, who works, if I'm commercially facing, then Steve very much is uh, NHS and research facing. Again, looking for partnerships. And I'm sure now you mentioned that we, he has been speaking to Steve, I think, um, about, I don't want to sure where that's gone to. So it might be worth what I can do after this then is yeah. dig out that conversation. Yeah, I bet now uh, Sam has your website. If you're handy having uh, two screens. <laughs> there. We're checking everything as you go. Yeah, we're stalking here already. Um, yeah, I think what I'll do then, 
if that's okay with you, I'll go back to Steve Milan, our colleague, and see where that con- conversation he was having got to, and then you know, use that to pick up with you guys. And I don't know if you were all do that originally, Nick, but if you weren't, then obviously we can make sure you're part of it. Yeah, I'm the housing development manager, so I'm looking, we're developing more of the abstinence-based housing so that we can connect in with all those different spokes, if you like. Absolutely. Um, and we are training some GPs, I believe. Um, so that, that side of it with the NHS is, is underway. Um, but I am, for me, I would like to look at research that demonstrates that the outrageous outcomes that we've had, to be fair, because they really are massively successful. Yeah, I think one of the messages, especially to businesses, is you know, the word research can scare the living daylights out of <laughs> Oh my God, it's all white coats and microscopes and um, you know, years of study and you get some bizarre conclusion at the end of it. We talk more about evaluation. Yes. Yeah, service evaluation. And again, a colleague in the team, um, Cheryl, Cheryl Simmel Binning is our eva- evaluation fellow um, and can talk to you about the basics. And it's not in a, I'm not insulting your intelligence, but about the basic no. evaluation, which is about, as you say, collecting the data. And you may be routinely collecting data that you might not realize is actually quite valuable. You know, if you've got, I don't know, if you capture demographic information and a bit of a, a mood or an indicator, or there's various things like, um, mental well-being scales if you're capturing any of that what they can do with that sort of data is, is amazing really in terms of going backwards and then making sure in going forward you've got more so i think that should be wrapped up into that conversation with steve and we'll bring cheryl in as well yeah. and talk about eva- evaluation and student projects can be a bit more agile than a fully funded research project yeah we can take we can look at it and we'll find if there's a call out there and we can build up ahead of steam, but it could take months to get something on that. We're also looking, Nick, as well, at working with Cheryl to design a full evaluation workshop that we could run. Yeah. Um, so then it means you could come and, we depends on probably a two-day workshop that will be fully funded, and you could come and find out all the basics about evaluation. Yeah. And then once you'd finish, we give you a one-to-one, and we try and mm. identify, is it a student project you need? For example, it's the Unite project, one of the yeah. other funded projects, give you 20 days of a student time. So even if they just came in and started doing some data collection and got you moving, and then if you were looking at more serious research, you've got the evidence base to start because yeah. you do need you need to actually have something to build yeah, on. That, that's one of the tricks with evaluation starting there because some grants, seem, some of the bigger grants, you need to have done something to get going. It's what sometimes a cart before the horse. Well, if I had that data, I wouldn't need to do the research to get the data because uh, so yeah, and, and we yeah, you know, I, I think guess. um we've got we are looking at social return on investment and things like that and um we do have quite a lot of data from from our um i mean for example we've got two years uh people who've been through the well two years ago and 68 percent of them have not reoffended and have not returned to substance misuse which is huge huge yeah. huge success rates in comparison to other things that's happening so it's about making sure we can back that with the research for me to you know it's great having that data as a standalone piece of information but mm-hmm. i think it's really important if we can get that available to people to recognize this model works it can then be replicated and, um, I, I, and, and that's where the nerdy side comes in <laughs> but i also re- we also recognize that as a team because we are mixed in terms of backgrounds you know i've, I've got commercial background and others have been in the NHS, et cetera, that what you really want as a business is stuff to market. Yeah. And again, your know, research doesn't translate well into marketing material, if you like, because there'll be a CCG or a, or a bid that you need to go to. And that's where this, so we, we cannot, we can't endorse services mm-hmm. per se, um, but we can help you generate the evidence that then leads to better marketing, if you like, because um, yeah, that, that, that's a commercial reality. You know. I also think as well, so it's not just necessarily looking traditionally at what we have within the Faculty of Health, I think across the mm, university. Yes. So the management schools, so one of the leading professors there is Steve Kempster, and he's mm. all about social return. So he's kind of like the future of businesses isn't about your profit margin, it's actually demonstrating social investment and social return. And what he's interested in is how you measure that. Um, so again, it could be looking, when we say getting an internship, it might be one of the master's students from LUMS, or we get a mix, or we look at actually what, what's best for you at that time. Yeah, Steve, Steve has this concept of good dividends, which yes. is the broad, yeah, so it's, it's in there. So thank you, I mean, yeah, we'll, yes, we'll, we'll follow up in that way, Nick, but thank you for coming along and, and having a chat.
No, thanks for thanks for chatting. I, I, I think you've got it. you've got people responding to you in the chat as oh, well. Oh, lovely, brilliant. <laughs> thanks very much. <laughs> we haven't talked to Paul, but thank you very much, Paul, for putting up the link to the town and gown events. <laughs> Yeah, and for the purpose of this recording, um, just Claire Louise mentioned a few few points that Social Value UK has a clear process of assessing beneficiary impact that is free and accessible, and she recommended approaching SROI with care life is not just about financial proxy. And I'm uh, just reading that out loud, that doesn't sound right, does that, it? That, that was, that was, that was well done, done Anna. <laughs> Well, well done. Yeah, I think what, what I'm just trying to say is, is particularly in response to Nick and anybody else who is looking at assigning values to social activity. There's quite a lot of methodology out there. Not, I think it would be great to work with the university, but just, just be aware that, and I think it's, it's about involving the people whose lives that you are changing into yeah. your research and the thing about SROI which is essentially it's a system for assigning financial proxies to social and environmental issues so things that are not easily valued financially and you've got to just be a bit careful about that because it changes it's, it's a very complex area um, I'm not saying don't do it it's just that it's not neither is it the panacea for all evils it's it's about taking a balanced approach, but um, but if you Nick, if you want to, my email's on there. If you want to have a quick chat about it, um, then I'm happy to point you in in various directions. All right. That sounds like a good connection, and I'm aware Sue, you have a question, but before that, I just want to raise the point that Irene made earlier up in the chat that it, there's a potential collaboration opportunity around design and engineering students working with patients on ways to improve living with their conditions so yes. just yeah. raising and that one of the offers we have like any university really are, are student projects and they tend to fall into two camps there's the curriculum based you know, annual student projects which are undergraduate and they're mainly in engineering do those they come at a fixed time of year so they're, they're not um you know, we have to wait until the opportunity is there and then we can put a bid in uh, but, but as sam's mentioned there's a program here called unite plus which creates, which pays students. So they tend to be postgraduates because they need to find 140 hours uh, to work with a business. Well, we pay them a minimum wage, so they get employment working with an, uh, an SME as well. So again, we're happy to have those conversations about how engineering can get involved. Just quickly, because I'm conscious of questions. One of the things as well, yeah. with the way the medical degree is designed here is that it's a completely different approach to traditional medicine. So they obviously do all the, the standard stuff they need to learn, but they get access to doing uh, multidisciplinary modules. So they're encouraged to do business, IT, engineering, so they can start thinking about healthcare from a different way. Great, thank you. And Sue Garner, you have a question. Hello, thank you. Hi, for your Hi Thank you for your presentation. I'm new to um, the centre and so it's been really lovely for me and exciting to see what's happening on my doorstep. So thank you for that. And, um, you know, it's really uh, lovely to see um, the recognition in, in a centre like yours of the environmental factors, the social factors, the economic factors of, of health. Um, and my question is uh, really around, because you mentioned the collaboration with SMEs, um, and also including social enterprise, also including charities. But I guess my interest is, well, um, you know, in all of those people who have been working in this, these fields uh, independently for some time. Uh, so I'm a yoga teacher and I also am very much connected with uh, acupuncturists and, um, and other people working in, I don't know, Tai Chi, tai chi or herbalists or all of those people working independently and I think one thing we do have already in Lancaster is um, and I know you're working wider than Lancaster but we we do have real community that has grown organically and I'm wondering what place is there in your plans for um, for linking with those networks of of practitioners independently because a slight concern I have is is an appropriation by big business of what has been happening very organically um, for a number of years. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So 
So two things. The first thing is the reason we're doing events like this is because we want to try and access groups just like the ones you're talking about. So the point of community for us is about, isn't actually about us dictating it, but making sure that we open our doors and make people feel like they can come and then shape it themselves. So we'd love to, to bring you in and actually see if we can support you as a community to deliver or to join what you're doing. But also for our project, we've worked with quite a number of well, yoga teachers, um, a wide variety of people that traditionally haven't actually accessed our SME support. So it's about, at, we're really keen to look at one, we've finished the assist, how can we carry on bringing those people together? Um, so I think it, we'd be really interested in, like, in coming up and hearing your ideas to bring in you up and seeing how you think the building could help that grow. Yeah, and so did, um, when you were talking, that do you know about Roots of Life? Yes. Yeah, so that's an example of, and I believe their remit is to, to bring that wide, wider community together. They have the book, they, they were doing events, obviously. Yeah. Um, so Debs and, uh, I can't remember a colleague, um, we, we, they, they would have moved into the hot, some of the hot desks here if we were allowed to hot desk. So again, we, we, we need, ideally, if we can find ready-made groups that we can collaborate with, then all the better. We also, um, where are we now? I think Tuesday uh, I hosted a tour of the HIC for Wellbeing Lancashire, which I think I mentioned earlier, as an embryonic organisation, which again are uh, micro businesses um, doing massage, doing uh, wellbeing at work, uh, doing, uh, uh, Celia does, has um, llamas and does, has a wellbeing centre now. So the, the, those networks are already there to some extent. Um, part of their job, if you like, and how we can enable them is to make sure they're known. Because what we don't want to see is a, so competing initiatives. Ideally, we're very much more about creating bigger pies than creating little pies and trying to slice them finer. So yeah, come and have a chat. We can introduce you to, there's a lady called Cheryl uh, Wilkinson who runs YOLO, who, who's leading on the well-being Lancashire and at Debs? If you know Roots of Life and Debs anyway, then that's that's the sort of links we could do. But if you've got your own idea, yeah, um, I was going to ask you, yeah. what is it you'd like to see? Oh, I don't know because I'm quite new to this, so I came today to find out. So I, it was just a genuine question about um, whether whether you already have those connections, and I think you've answered my question very well, actually, and it feels very welcoming so thank you for that invitation yeah, come, come, come up have a chat. Yeah. I'm trying to remember, there's a yoga is it out I've, I've tried to write down the name is it Al Melu yoga in Lancaster again pre-lockdown we took we met up with them and we the hick needs a program of yoga uh, we believe um, yeah. it may be just breathing exercises not the, maybe the full remit uh, because as it gets populated it's going to have to be a healthier space because we need to live that message, as I say. Yeah. So and those Helen Kimber, we've got Helen Kimber. Helen Kimber. Yeah. So we've got, yeah. So come and have a chat with us. Uh, you know, you know, we'll we'll have a chat. And we'll listen. We'll buy you a coffee or a or a herbal tea or whatever it is that would uh, would do the job, and we can have a chat. Thank you. Yes, it wasn't just about yoga. It was about really that the the networks of independent people in those those uh, diverse We, we, re we recognise. Yes. We recognise the difficulty micro businesses have in that you have to be everything, don't you? You have to earn the money and be an MD and a marketing director and do the sales. So by by creating those affinity groups, there's a, a sharing. And hopefully, that will happen of experience and possibly a process and, and functions that will help others get set up and make you more sustainable. Or identifying common challenges, mm. and then that's our job to see if we can find a way to up with ways of looking at those yeah. together all right it's um come to the end of our hour so i'm going to respect the time it went quickly and it was a really interesting discussion um thank you sam and glenn for presenting and for all the really good questions um, and i hope you've all got your contact details but if not just email me afterwards because i've been in touch and i i do have each of your contact details so i can put you in touch um, so thank you again and if you want to see what else is happening during the next four days go to the Lancaster Health Festival website. Uh, so note that Nick mentioned the need for local yoga practitioners so get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, 
Okay, so thank you everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now and the meeting. So have a good day. Anna, thanks, thanks for the invite, thanks for, Anna. Yeah, thanks for your support. Appreciate Anna. it. Nice to meet you. Bye. Okay, take Bye. care.